Hello everyone. In the previous sections, we have seen how the MRI signal arises from a collection of nuclear magnetic moments processing within the transverse plane, inducing a current in the RF coil. The signal, or free induction decay, is then amplified, digitised and stored for processing on the scanner's computer. This time domain, FID, is then Fourier transformed to produce a spectrum of the frequencies that contribute signal to the FID. So far we have considered that the FID is the total signal from all of the spins within the sample and we have no information as to where in the sample the spins are located. In the next two videos we will describe how it is possible to encode spins with a frequency according to their position and thereby build a two-dimensional map of signal from water molecules which provides the basis of an image. Before we look at how the spins can be spatially encoded, it is important to understand some of the properties of RF excitation pulses in more detail. We have thought of an RF wave as being applied to the spins at the Lamour frequency, that is, the wave contains only that single frequency. And this is true if the wave is continuous. However, if an RF wave propagated at a single frequency is truncated in time, such as is the case for a short pulse of RF, then this truncated RF wave will contain a range of frequency components to higher and lower frequencies than the main central or carrier frequency. So an RF pulse is able to excite a broad envelope of frequencies and the width of this envelope is known as the excitation bandwidth of the pulse. This envelope of frequencies has a shape defined by the RF intensity as a function of frequency. It turns out that the shape of this excitation profile is represented approximately by the Fourier transformation of the RF pulse envelope waveform. Waveforms that are related by the Fourier transform are known as Fourier pairs, since the Fourier transform is reversible. So here we have a rectangular waveform which defines the shape of an RF envelope. The Fourier transform of a rectangular waveform is this waveform, which is called a sinc function and has the form sine x over x. This is the shape of the frequency excitation profile of a rectangular RF pulse. You can see that the RF response is not even across the frequency bandwidth, that there are lobes of excitation outside of the main central lobe with points where there is zero excitation. In MRI, it is usually desirable to have equal excitation across the entire bandwidth of the pulse to ensure that all spins receive the same RF intensity and are rotated by the same angle, giving a uniform response and maximum signal. That is, we aim for a rectangular excitation profile. How do we achieve this? Well, since the rectangular shaped pulse generates a sink shaped profile, then it follows that a sink shaped RF pulse will generate a rectangular shaped excitation profile, since they are Fourier pairs. So in MRI, most RF pulses are electronically shaped so as to produce the best possible excitation profile. Here are some examples. The first is the central part of a sink function which produces a shape that is almost rectangular but with small side lobes and a central region that has sloped sides. These artefacts are introduced because the sink waveform has been truncated to include only one side lobe. The shape of the profile is improved if more of the sink lobes are issued. But this is at the expense of requiring more power to produce a 90 degree rotation and, for the same overall pulse time, produces a broader excitation profile. Other shapes are sometimes used, for example, a Gaussian shaped pulse will produce a Gaussian shaped profile. The frequency bandwidth excited by a pulse is inversely proportional to the length of the pulse or the pulse time TP. So a short pulse will excite a broad range of frequencies and as the pulse length is increased in time the frequency bandwidth decreases. So we can tailor the pulses we use to suit the frequency bandwidth that we require. This will become important for being able to selectively excite 
only a particular slice of spins in the imaging scan, as we will see in a moment. As I mentioned earlier, to this point we have excited and observed the signal from all of the spins within our sample. The magnetic field strength B0 determines the precessional frequency of the nuclei according to the Lamour equation. We have considered the magnetic field to be constant over the sample, and so all the spins have the same Lamour frequency, give or take some variations due to field inhomogeneity. So if we were to consider the Lamour frequency of spins along a particular axis through the magnet, let's say along the z-direction of the magnet, then all the spins will have the same Lamour frequency at every position along that direction. However, if we deliberately introduce a variation of the B0 field in that direction, such that the field strength linearly increased from one end to the other, in this case lower on the left hand side, increasing to the right and equal in the centre, then the Lamour frequency of spins will vary as a function of position along that direction. In the centre, the frequency will not have changed. This linearly changing B0 field is called a field gradient and is generated in an MRI magnet by applying current through specially designed coils of wire, as we will see in a later section. The linear field gradient generated by these gradient coils adds to the main field B0. If we apply a steeper field gradient, then the difference in Lamour frequencies at the same two points along the z-direction will increase. So now we have a means by which we can spatially encode the frequency of spins along a particular direction in space. So what does this mean for a sample of water in the magnet? Here is a cube of water in a uniform B0 field. If we excite the sample, acquire the signal, and Fourier transform the FID, we obtain a frequency spectrum with a peak at a single frequency arising from all the water protons in the sample. If a gradient is added to the B0 field along a particular direction, then the water proton signals will now have a spread of frequencies according to the position of the water molecules along that gradient direction. So we can use a combination of this linear field gradient and its associated frequency gradient together with a frequency selective RF pulse to excite a particular slice of spins. Here we see on the vertical axis an RF pulse which has a 2000 Hz excitation bandwidth. If a field gradient is applied which produces a frequency variation of 2000 Hz per centimetre along its direction then it follows that only a section of the sample will be excited by the pulse creating a slice of excited spins with a thickness of one centimetre. This slice will be orientated in the plane perpendicular to the direction of the field gradient and will be centred at the central frequency of the RF pulse. We can change the thickness of this slice by changing the bandwidth of the RF pulse. Increasing the pulse length will decrease the bandwidth and therefore make the slice thinner. Decreasing the pulse length will increase the bandwidth, selecting a thicker slice. Alternatively, we can change the steepness of the field gradient. As the gradient is increased, that is, increasing the frequency spread per centimetre, the slice of spins will become narrower. For example, if the gradient strength was doubled to 4000 Hz per centimetre, then the slice of excited spins would be 5 millimetres thick. So those spins that reside within a slice where the Lamour frequency matches the central frequency of the RF pulse will be excited. With a slice thickness according to the pulse bandwidth and the gradient strength. So we can easily move the position of the slice simply by changing the central RF frequency of the selective pulse. We can now scan along the direction of the slice gradient creating a slice of excited spins at any position we choose. This use of selective RF pulses in the presence of a field gradient is the basis for slice selection in MRI and this gradient is referred to as the slice gradient. In the next section we will describe how the spins within this slice can be frequency encoded 
in each of the two directions in the plane of the slice, therefore creating a two-dimensional image.